Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. We're going to be talking about upgrading your uke. So if you're looking for your second ukulele, or if you're looking just to add to your collection. So we're going to look at some features like tone wood, pickups, and body shape, so that it can help you find what you're looking for at the right price to fit your budget. This video is not sponsored, but the majority of these ukes were borrowed from Hyde Music, or these ukes were sent to me in PR. I completely understand that upgrading can mean different things to different people because to one person, you could look at an item and say, yes, I know exactly why that is priced that way. I think that's a fair price. And another person, it could be the exact opposite. Like, no way am I spending $1,000. You don't have to spend $1,000 in order to upgrade your ukulele or to find an instrument that is going to fit your needs. So just piggybacking off of my first point right there is, budget. You have to set your budget. What are you willing to spend on your second ukulele or another ukulele to add to your collection? Start there. In the previous video, we talked about trying to find the right size of ukulele for you. So if you're looking for your second ukulele or if you're looking just to add to your collection, you may want to try a different size. Go and visit my uke buyer's guide for beginners to see how you can test a uke to see if it's the right size for you. I'm gonna put that in the description box below and also the cards above so that you can see how I test out an instrument. In the beginner's guide, I mentioned how materials affect tone and price of an instrument. And I also mentioned that I've played laminate instruments that have better tone than those of solid tone wood and vice versa. But really the only way that you can find the right size or just the right tone of instrument is really to try as many as you possibly can. Other materials and features will reflect the instrument's price, like specialty tuners. Saddles and nuts made of synthetic materials make instruments more affordable compared to ones made of bone. And some argue that bone has better vibration transfer than those made out of synthetic materials. And other manufacturers claim that their synthetic materials are just as good, if not better. Different tone woods will differ in sound, so do your research and play as many as you can. Some have more mids, some sound brighter, some sound very balanced. You'll see a jump in price if the wood is considered master grade and premium, and if the labor and materials are ethically sourced like this KPA Canilea made of premium koa. That means the wood was acquired in a sustainable way and that the workers involved making it were treated fairly. I hope it does make you think, and it also has made me think a lot about the materials in which something is made out of. Where did it come from? Who made it? And were they treated well? And also not only were the people treated well, but just environmentally overall, were they thinking about the overall impact? Hey, Editing Katie here. Just wanted to mention something to you about brands. I think we are aware that just because something is from a reputable brand doesn't mean that it's going to be a product that is going to be right for us. So don't look at brand, don't look at price, just pull the instrument off the shelf play it and then see if it's going to be the one that's right for you, if it matches what you are looking for. And then you can decide whether or not you want to pay for it or not. And then not, then there's always something else. It's really a buyer's market. There's a lot of variety out there, but just because we have things from our favorite brands doesn't mean that, that brand is going to hit it out of the park every single time for us. So just had to mention that. Now, a subscriber left me a comment saying that once you're paying over $500 for an ukulele, you're really just paying for the brand name. And I have to respectfully disagree because yes, in some cases, I would say I agree with you that in some cases you are paying for the brand. You are paying extra for just the, the actual, you know, clout of having something that has a reputation. That's not necessarily a bad thing uh, because they've been around for a while for a reason. They've sustained their brand and their reputation for a reason. It's because they have produced consistently well over time. But I have to argue it's more than just a brand name. It's craftsmanship, the process, the materials. Every design choice has a purpose, a function, and all of it takes time. And they should be paid a fair price for their time. I'll leave links to my interviews with master luthiers Bruce Petros and Joe Souza of Canilea, and you'll see why they're considered masters at their craft. I've never played anything like their ukes. Now let's talk about design features. Cutaways, they allow you to access the upper part of the fretboard comfortably. Now, can you reach the upper part of the fretboard with something that doesn't have a cutaway? Yes, you could. So you really should just play a bunch and just find out like, yeah, I think that this one would be comfortable for me or not because it's really player's choice. 
it really is player's preference. There is a debate, though, whether a cutaway or not actually takes away from the overall tone. Some people argue that because there's less surface area that it actually takes away from the overall tone of the instrument. And some people say, no, that that's not necessarily the case. It doesn't matter that this piece is missing because most of the vibration transfer from the strings occurs here at the bridge and the saddle. And then that is what causes the top to move. The, vi the majority of the vibration occurs here and not here. Some people say it doesn't matter. Some people say it does. But I think it all depends upon the manufacturer, the tone wood, uh, the bracing, the strings, the size of the ukulele. Those are all going to be contributing factors to the overall tone. Cut away, or no cutaway. So really, again, you have to try as many as you possibly can and then figure out like, yeah, that's the one that I want or no, it that's not it. So you just have to consider that. I don't think it's just cutaway alone that is going to take away from the tone of an instrument. Now, many people that have been playing for a while, they would like to play at coffee shops or they would like to gig. You don't necessarily need a pickup. You could actually just mic it properly and you'd be just fine. But some people, they are looking for pickups. So we have to talk about the different kinds of pickups and then maybe you can find the one that is going to fit your needs the best. So the first one is going to be a transducer pickup. Transducer pickups are said to have the most lifelike representation of an acoustic instrument's tone and are usually close to the soundboard and pick up the instrument's vibrations. So it's not being filtered through anything else, just very pure, but it also has a tendency to feed back. So that brings me to a piezo pickup. Piezo pickups, otherwise known as undersaddle pickups, are the most common type of acoustic pickup that sit under the bridge of the instrument and pick up the vibrations from the strings rather than the residents of the body and are generally pretty resistant to feedback. It may sound a little bit more synthetic or less authentic than what the other pickup would be able to offer you. There are microphone paired acoustic pickups that feature a magnetic undersaddle or contact pickup paired with a microphone, which allows for more diverse sound capture. But that also brings me to two other categories. It brings me to active and passive pickups. Passive pickups don't boost the signal, hence the name passive, so you won't find a battery. These pickups usually have a warm and pure tone and are very versatile. This is great for smaller venues, but if you need to boost your signal, you may have to consider a preamp. You may have to buy something extra in order to boost that signal if you're playing at a larger venue. Now, active pickups require a power source, which is usually powered by a nine volt battery or button batteries in most ukuleles. It boosts the signal, so there's a higher amount of signal output. You can also adjust the frequencies like the treble, the bass, or both from your instrument. And some people say that they don't sound as pure as the actual instrument acoustically. On this Lanaka, you'll see the Fishman Kula preamp. And I do have certain ukuleles that do have the Fishman Kula preamp. And it really works well for where I play. I play at a very large church. So the sanctuary holds... Um, just over 1800 people. So anytime that I've brought in another ukulele that doesn't have the Fishman Kula preamp, it's been difficult for the sound people to pick up my sound and they really have to boost it. And you have to be careful with that because if you boost that sound, the more signal you're pushing through the system, it's more susceptible to feedback and to some other things. And so if I have this one, because it's powered by a nine volt battery as well, they've never had a problem pushing the signal. So uh, those would be a plug and play situation instead of plug and pray. <laughs> so you have to think about the venue in which you're playing. You have to think about what's going to be best for the situation or just basically fit your needs the best. Let's look at necks. So I have two Cordoba ukuleles, both tenor. And uh, you look right here, do you see this part right here? The scarf joint, it's two pieces of wood glued together, and then you can see that little curve right there. That scarf joint is pretty low. Typically, the higher the scarf joint is on the neck, or if the neck is made of one solid piece of wood, it increases the vibration and the overall tone of the instrument because you don't have vibrations having to pass through glue and barriers. It also increases the price. Is that necessarily true? It's some good food for thought there, but again, like I've told you before, you gotta try the instrument. You have to try them back to back and then you can decide, yes, I do hear a difference or nope, doesn't matter to me. 
slotted headstocks versus solid headstocks. Some believe that slotted headstocks are easier to tune, that they're smoother, uh, there's a less likelihood of them to jump in tuning, and some say that it's easier to change the strings on the slotted headstock, or some people actually prefer the solid headstock. I really don't mind either. I've changed strings on both. It's really not a deciding factor for me. Some people believe that the slotted headstock allows the strings to be more responsive because there's more tension across the strings because it lays over the nut at a sharper angle so that it'd be more responsive for finger picking. Some people believe that's a bunch of bologna salami. <laughs> I think that what you need to do is, again, you need to play one and then actually decide whether a slotted headstock is going to be something that is right for you. Or you just like the overall look of the slotted headstock. I think it's very, very pretty. Some slotted headstocks have the tendency to weigh down the headstock, so it might feel a little unbalanced. This does not. It's very well balanced. This headstock is very lightweight. Have I played other slotted headstocks where it, this is significantly heavier than this portion? Yes, I have. So really have to pick it up and try it and see if it's right for you. I wanted to play the acacia and the solid mahogany ukulele back to back. Same concept, same design. You're going to see a difference in price and also a difference in tone because they're different tone woods. So you let me know in the comments section below which one you preferred. Lanakai ukuleles, they have a wider neck profile. And so if you're thinking about like, well, what, what does that mean? It means that this portion right here is wider to be able to fit a variety of hands. Sometimes people think that ukuleles are just a little bit hard to handle uh, because they're just a little bit thinner right through here. Now, is it so wide where it's going to be uncomfortable? for somebody with smaller hands to play. I don't think so. I'm five foot one and I'm petite. I have no problems playing this.
This one is by far, I think, the thinnest that I've ever experienced. I love the rounded back because it just adds that extra surface area for that projection. It's super lightweight and it's really nice added touch that it has a little pickup in here with the button battery, strap buttons. It feels really, really comfortable to play. So if you're looking for something that's more so on the travel side or just something just a little bit thinner that doesn't really compromise with sound, this one is a really good one. Also, the other thin one that I'm about to play for you, the Ohana Thin uh, Ukulele, that's also a great one. That sustain is awesome. absolutely no problems with this when I was traveling with it. it was, it's been on a couple of planes with me this past year. I, I love the tone. I do like th that the extra thin body right here just it just makes it a little more compact, a little bit more travel friendly, but it just overall I love it. <laughs> with the bare tone you have more space between the frets you are going to have to use different chord shapes and voicings well the shapes might be similar to that of the ukulele but they're going to be different names <laughs> because the tune completely differently than a standard ukulele love the bound fretboard right here because fret sprout you're not going to have a problem with that especially on collas that are uh, the higher end collas i've seen this bound so well and sealed So let's get into some specialty models, just some out of the ordinary that I thought that would be really cool to show you. We have this arch top model, and then you have this resonator. Now, the idea behind a resonator is that before there was proper amplification for your instrument, uh, they had resonating instruments. And so there's this piece of metal right here. So there's that much more, uh, there's that much more hard surface for the sound to bounce off of to be able to project that sound of that instrument. Let me know in the comment section below what you think of this instrument. What do you think of the tone? It's rather unique. It could be really nice if you're playing in an ensemble and you're looking to stand out just a little bit or just round out the sonic spectrum, so to speak.
you're looking to round out your collection, you'd like something just a little bit different, this is really cool. I do have to say that this portion right here of the neck does feel a little heavy but it's not so uncomfortable and so unbalanced where it's uncomfortable to play. I thought it was very comfortable to play, very comfortable to control. Now, of course, the sky's the limit when it comes to instruments because there's so much variety out there. I've only been able to sample a few things here and there for you. It would be impossible to sample them all, but there are so many beautiful master craftsmen out there that are making beautiful instruments. Do your research, see if you can find the one that is right for you, not for anybody else, but for you, I have to emphasize that. If you have an ukulele that you have fallen in love with, leave that in the description box below. I wanna hear from you, because your experience is really valuable. Your opinions matter. So I hope to see you in the next one. If you wanna learn how to play the ukulele, I have lots of different ukulele lessons from beginner, intermediate, and also a little bit dabbling into finger style as well. I'm gonna leave that in the cards all around me, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.